Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee 6 meeting of 2019. We have no apologies. Agenda item 1 is a decision on taking business in private. Are members content to take item 6 on the committee's work programme in private? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item 2 is an evidence session on an affirmative instrument. The Sheriff Court Simple Procedure Limits of, on Awards of Expenses Amendment Order 2019 Draft. And I welcome Ash Denham. Minister for Community Safety and her officials, Walter Drummond Murray, Courts and Tribunal uh, Policy Officer, and Samantha Rohr, Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. Um, this item is a chance for members, obviously, to put uh, questions to ministers and their officials, seeking clarification on the instruments before we formally dispose of it. And I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? I have a very brief one, if that is OK, yes. with the committee. Um, so the expenses order that's been laid supports the operation of the new simple procedure that was partially introduced on the 28th of November 2016. For low-value claims, it's been recognised that the cost of obtaining legal representation will often be disproportionate to the sum sued for, and it's therefore unreasonable to ex expose litigants to these types of low-value cases to uncertain expenses in the event that they are the unsuccessful party. So therefore, for cases with a value of under £3,000, the Sheriff Court Simple Procedure Limit on Award of Expenses Order 2016 restricted the recoverability of expenses in small claims by reference to the monetary value of the claim. The 2019 order that has been laid makes minor amendments to the 2016 order so that for claims with a value of under £300, no claim for expenses can be made. And this is a small change from the £200 that it is currently set at. The rationale for this change is to ensure continuing alignment with the court fees system, which from the 1st of April 2019 will amend the level of the claim that attracts the minimal court fee of £19 from 200 to 300. And the committee will recall considering the relevant share of court fees order uh, this time last year. So the intention of this alignment is to ensure that low value litigation is not rendered prohibitive either by the court fee or the possibility of an award of expenses. Do members have any questions or comments? No? Yes, yes. yes. sorry yeah. Liam. Just very briefly, yeah. just for interest, um, Minister, um, where, where did the 300 come from? I, I, I know you've aligned it to the court fee system, but why 300 I mean, from 200? Um, it's just in order, this, the simple procedure is just meant to be um, much easier for people so that they can, so we just thought we'd to bring it into line, so just to raise it slightly to bring it into line um, so that it would um, be more appropriate, a more appropriate figure. Any other questions? No? Okay, that being the case, agenda item three is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative <coughs> instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and has no comments on it. The motion is 15... 15526 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Sheriff Court simple procedure limits on award of expenses amendment order 2019 draft be approved. Minister to move the motion. Moved. Okay. Um, do members have any comments? No. And um, in that case I put the question is the motion 1526 in the name of Ash Denon to be approved? Are we agreed? It is great. Uh, that concludes consideration of the instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Are members content to agree to, to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft report? Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Alex, suspend briefly to allow the officials supporting the minister to change places. Mm -hmm.
Agenda item four is an evidence session on an affirmative instrument on the Drug Driving Special Limits Scotland Regulations 2019 draft. And joining the, the Minister is Philip Lamont, uh, Criminal Justice Division, and Louise Miller, Director for Legal Services with the Scottish Government. Again, this is um, a chance for, minister, for members to put to the ministers and their officials any points of clarification they may seat on the instrument before we formally dispose of it. I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk, and paper three, which is private paper, and invite the minister to make a, an opening statement. Thank you, convener. So the drug driving regulations that are being considered this morning are an important step forward in seeking to improve road safety in Scotland. The regulations provide for the different drug types that will be included in the new offence and the limits associated with each of these drug types. The approach adopted with the regulations follows consideration of the Scottish results of a UK-wide consultation which found general support for the limits proposed. The implementation of the new offence will have an effect on various agencies within our justice system, including Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. In particular, the Scottish Police Authority will be required to provide forensic testing of blood taken from those suspected of committing the new offence to assess which drug types and at what levels are in a person's blood. As part of consideration of what drug types should be included within the new offence, the SPA carried out an analysis of what drug types were identified amongst drivers caught over a six-month period, and this was from July to December 2017, under the existing driving while impaired through drugs offence. And that analysis revealed that of the 261 drug driving impairment cases during that period, just over half, so that was 51% involved cannabis, just under half, so that was 49% involved diazepam, and just over a quarter, so 28% involved cocaine. These drug types are included in the 17 drug types covered by the new offence and overall 95% of the impairment cases revealed the presence of at least one of the drug types included within the new offence. Each of these cases either represented where a drug type included within the new offence was the only drug type identified or it was identified in combination with other drug types including drug types that are not included within the new offence. The analysis suggests that the list of 17 drug types provided for in the new offence provides very good coverage of the drug types most commonly used in Scotland by those currently being caught driving while impaired through drugs. Although 95% of all cases tested contained at least one drug type included within the new offence, it should be noted that only 43% of samples had one or more drug type included within the new offence that was over the limit associated with each drug type. So this indicates that there, were, there will be a continuing need to consider prosecution for drivers who have drugs within their system under the existing driving while impaired through drugs offence in those cases. And that offence is, of course, unaffected by these regulations. Um, what the analysis also reveals is that the extent of poly drug use in Scotland, with approximately 45% of all impairment offences showing four or more drugs within a person's system. This clearly suggests that where a drug type may have been taken that is not on the list of 17, it's very often been taken in combination with a drug that is on the list. This means it would be caught by the new offence if the drug type limit has been exceeded for the drug type in question. On this basis, and following consideration of the Scottish views offered to the 2013 consultation, we consider it appropriate to proceed with the introduction of the limits in Scotland based on the 17 drug types and associated limits already used in England and Wales. If Parliament approves these regulations, Scotland will have the toughest criminal law approach on drink and drug driving in the UK, with the lowest drink driving limit as well as robust drug driving limits through this new offence. We hope that the new offence will act as a clear deterrent to those who may wish to take drugs and drive. 
and I'm happy to take any questions, convener. Okay, I'll open it up to questions. Before, before I do, could I ask you, perhaps, Minister, um, has any consideration been given to the type of device that um, the Scottish Government is thinking of deploying, given that um, I think at present there's been some um, concern or um, dissatisfaction that the device used uh, south of the border could only identify two types of, of drug as opposed to um, the ones, a, a device that would um, detect all the banned drugs? Yes, so I'm sure the committee will be aware that the, um, the testing device that's used at the roadside um, currently in England and Wales, obviously you'll understand that um, ultimately the decision for what type of device is used by Police Scotland is an operational decision that's a matter for them. But I think it's safe to say that it's very likely um, that device or something very similar to that is what will end up being used in Scotland. I don't know if um, my official would like to add anything to that. And in terms of other drug types being capable of being detected using screening devices, um, to a certain extent um, we would be reliant on the UK government because these devices need to be what's called type approved. And so there are only two devices or one device that's type approved for cannabis and cocaine. Type approval is a, a means of ensuring the kind of the validity and the um, robustness of the, the testing procedure. Um, and you can't, Police Scotland and police forces in England and Wales would not want to use any devices that were not type approved. So the, the UK government would need to type approve other devices. And as of today, no other devices are type approved other than for cannabis and cocaine. So does that severely limit um, the amount of um, people who might be I might be actually under the, the 17 or so drugs that have been identified. It's 17, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, with the initial, is it going to be a phased approach then, um, gradually bringing it in and then hoping to, to increase um, the, the amount that will be detected? It might be, it might be helpful to explain that there's the roadside devices of which is cannabis and cocaine, but in terms of forensic testing, in other words, the testing that is done by the Scottish Police Authority, which produces the evidence that will be used in criminal cases, that is separate and that will cover all 17. So this is just at the Police Scotland side, the devices they have are, are, are based on cannabis and cocaine. What Police Scotland will likely do, but it's a matter for them, is continue to use field impairment tests, etc., to detect if they think someone's taken drugs. And then if they have enough suspicion to take them back to the police station, there'll be a process by which a blood test is taken and then the full analysis will be done of that person's blood. And that's the evidence that's used in court and that will be capable of assessing for all 17 drug types. Right, that's helpful, very helpful. John Finney, followed by Liam MacArthur and Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Valmé, and per perhaps to Mr Lamont, because it is a, a follow-on from what he, he said. I'm, I'm pleased the Minister referred to the existing legislation, the long-standing legislation about uh, impairment through the drink or drugs. I'm trying to understand, and, and th th this will remain on the statute book, um, and in our brief we have the quote that the, the Minister talked about, the 95%, and then goes on to say it should be noted that only 43% of these samples had one, was over the limit associated with that drug type use. And then that quote, which the Minister used, which is in our brief there too, um, indicates the continuing need to use. How, how does that happen? Say, for instance, that um, I, there's a lot of case law around this, that um, a driver is tested. Um, it's not believed that the, the driver is impaired. They happen to have been stopped in a line of vehicles that have been stopped. The driving is impaired. How can you move from one to other? Is there, is there not going to be difficulties with that? If the, if the rationale for undertaking the test in the first place wasn't that you believe that the, the ability to drive would be impaired through the consumption of drugs, and that doesn't exceed that test, if you follow what I mean, how then do you move to the fallback position? Well, one way that might work, might happen, is if the police, firstly, the police, as you say, they can't just stop someone and test them. They have to have, um, maybe they've been involved in an accident or they've received a report that someone's been driving after being, after taking drugs, or indeed they maybe have been driving in an erratic way. But once they stop someone, they may, for example, if, if they do the field impairment test, which may give them an, uh, enough evidence or suspicion to take them back to the police station and then go through a formal procedure to authorise a blood test, they may also see drugs in a person's car, which might give suspicion that they've taken drugs and, and drove. Um, so the, the, road screen, the roadside screening devices for cannabis and cocaine are obviously very relevant for those two drugs, only relevant for those two drugs. But there are other ways in which police will... Um, 
suspect someone has taken drugs and, dr and, and drove and, and they'll be able to take them back to the police station if, the, if there is evidence to suggest that, to then get the blood test, which is the crucial thing that will be used in a criminal case. The road screen, to be clear, the road se roadside screening devices are not used in, as evidence. They're just to give enough um, suspicion for cannabis and cannabis and cocaine to take them back to the police station. So it's certainly true it makes it easier to detect cannabis and cocaine than the other drug types, but they're not the only way in which someone can be taken back to a police station. So, so this is an, an, an additional offence that will give the, the police... Um, um, I think it's going to work out it's going to be easier to prosec get prosecutions because you don't need to prove that level of impairment. So it's an additional offence that should help the police. Good. Two very brief, if I may, thank, thank you, Kavira. Um, Minister, um, the, the question of new psychoactive substances, um, are you content that they can be picked up by way of this legislation and the existing legislation, and at any time was consideration given to um, an ability to the police to, to stop anyone, random? Well, obviously, as is the case in any type of legislation, you know, we will keep this fully under review and we will look at all the evidence and we will then be able to either adjust the type of drugs that are on the list or adjust the limits that the drugs um, types are set at. So we will review the evidence and if at any time we feel that the evidence suggests that that needs to be done, that either the, the types need to be extended or the limits need to be changed, then we can obviously do that by secondary legislation. And the question of the police having the ability to stop anyone randomly? We we'll still have to... Um, feel that someone is, is driving, you know, they have to have a reason to stop them. It might be helpful also to clarify that the law in that area is reserved. What's been devolved in this area is simply the ability to set the limits and the, specify the drug types. And then for um, alcohol limit, that was devolved so the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government could set the alcohol limit. All the other powers associated with this area are reserved, so it wouldn't be within the competence. Of, it would be for Westminster to decide whether that was appropriate. OK, thank you very much. The mentory, you're on okay. yeah, just briefly, on, uh, following from John's question, just to clarify, are psychoactive drugs not on the list at the moment? They're not on the list, no. OK, thank you. Liam MacArthur, Daniel, then Liam Kerr. Yeah, I was going to follow up that point as well. Obviously, the, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society had given evidence um, drawing our attention to the, the, yeah, the absence of new psychoactive substances from the, the list. I, I mean, I suspect, given the, the rate at which um, those uh, reformulate and reformulate, um, it would be difficult to, to write them into to, to legislation. But um, I, I suppose it was slightly surprising from the, the figures you were giving earlier about um, the breakdown of um, drugs that, that had been taken in, in, in instances where individuals had been, uh, had been stopped didn't include a sizable proportion of probably a range of, of, of legal, uh, so-called legal highs. Uh, to, to what extent has that been factored into um, the, the, the workings in, in terms of how this legislation is, is expected to, or these changes to legislation are expected to, to, to bite? The, seven, the, the reason it's been taken to, to the 17 drugs as listed is obviously the extent of the research and the analysis that's been done. It's also based on, obviously, that this um, legislation has been working in England and Wales for a number of years now, and we've been able to look at that um, for lessons to be learned and to see that it, it does seem to be working quite effectively south of the border. Uh, and the other thing um, to note is that it becomes... It's obviously quite complicated to go to the lab and then test forensically for the 17 types Obviously, the 17 does give us a very broad coverage, which is the most important thing to note. Uh, at this point, we consider that this, this will give us very broad coverage, the 95%. And if we were to extend it, which ultimately we could do, you could put any drug, of, of course, that you wanted to on this list, but it, every time you do that, it increases complexity. Um, but I'll let um, my official just explain that point to you a little bit further, if you'd like. Um, uh, what have been the lessons, in a sense, from England and Wales in relation to the treatment of, of legalised? Because certainly um, what, what we are told is, is certainly within a, a particular demographic, that problem is, is growing and in some cases growing exponentially. So one would assume that you would then see that um, played out in, in, in relation to, to the evidence that might be emerging from England and Wales. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's fair to say that the 95% coverage is of the existing sample of people caught while driving while impaired 
so that for the 17 drug types, 95% is obviously a very high number. Within, within those figures, there will be clearly some people who have taken um, such substances and it's something that can be kept under review. And certainly we will be continuing to work with colleagues in the Scottish Police Authority to analyse the data on the results of their testing to see how prevalent other substances not on the list are so that we can keep it under review to see whether they should be added. But in terms of the coverage, we, we are satisfied that the 95% figure is, is, a, is a robust figure. I just want to move on to the, the issue of, of public awareness. I mean, obviously there's an issue for those who are on prescribed um, uh, medicines that, 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 that uh, touch on some of those that are listed here. Uh, there'd be an awareness raising needed there amongst those who are taking those and, and indeed those who are prescribing and administering them. Um, but there's also a wider public awareness um, uh, campaign I think we need to be uh, embarked upon. Uh, again, Royal Pharmaceutical Society but others who've given evidence have, have pointed to that. Are you able to outline the steps that government is going to take, um, either directly or through agencies, to, to, to raise that public awareness about the changes being introduced? Yes, you're right to say that obviously um, there is a role here for medical professionals and pharmacists in, in terms of making sure people have the correct information. And obviously those that are on prescription medications um, would obviously be able to rely on the medical defence as long as they comply with instructions that are given to them by their medical professional. So for that um, reason, um, we will be making sure that they have bespoke information um, and advice that's made available to all um, medical practitioners, and that would include obviously pharmacists um, regarding this change in the law and also the operation of medical defence. So, and this offence, it wouldn't intend to change any decisions that are made medically um, in the treatment of a patient, but we want to obviously make sure that people are aware of how um, this would affect them. Um, on a wider note, clearly we want um, awareness to be raised because we want to change people's behaviour. That's um, why we want to do this. We want to make the road safer and we don't want people obviously to be... Um, uh, driving cars while they're impaired by either alcohol or drugs, as in this case. And so we will obviously be undertaking an awareness raising campaign to make sure people are fully aware of the change in the law, which hopefully will help to change their behaviour. We are currently um, uh, sort of looking into that at the moment, so it will certainly involve social media, but at the moment we haven't completely finalised what shape exactly the awareness raising campaign will take, but it will be um, finalised in the next few weeks. In terms of, of those who are on prescription medications, has there been an assessment made of the risk, possibly looking at, at what's happened in England and Wales, about people um, potentially not taking the medication they should be taking for fear of, 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 of falling foul of, of, of these sorts of laws? Well, that's why it's very important that everybody has the correct information and it shouldn't make any difference. So, obviously, if you're a medical professional has prescribed you a medication and told you that if you take it appropriately that you're fine to drive, you're, you're fine to continue to do that. But there are obviously some cases with some medicines where your doctor will tell you that you're not safe to drive while you're on that medicine. So people need to comply with the instructions they're being given by their medical professional. And if they do that, then um, they'll be fine and they will be in accordance with the law. From, from the experience in England and Wales, is, has, has that emerged as, a, as an issue or is it, has it been managed reasonably effectively? I'm not aware of it being a major issue. There may be the odd case where someone is confused, but certainly it's not come out as a major issue. Daniel Johnson. I'd just like to follow up on those points, and I'd like to just begin by declaring an interest. I, I take a controlled drug uh, on a prescribed basis. I take methylphenidate uh, to, uh, 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 as a result of my ADHD diagnosis. Um, I mean, what, what, what will you people have to rely on? Will they be required to be fully aware of the small print on the med that comes with their medication? I mean, you correctly say that, that the medical advice uh, should sh should be clear to them. But how are you going to make sure that people are aware whether or not they are safe to drive? And indeed, uh, I think there's also the, the, the flip side of that, of people being worried that they may be in breach of the law when they, they don't need to worry because either the, the drug that they take isn't within this list or indeed they're, they're well within kind of the safe limits based on medical advice. So obviously that comes under the wider awareness raising campaign. But again, as I've already said, you know, updated guidance to medical professionals and pharmacists to make sure that they are um, advising um, their patients correctly. But it is also people's duty to make sure that if they are consuming medicines, that they are not impaired. And if they feel that they are impaired, then they shouldn't be driving. But as we've already discussed, if you're taking the medication at the appropriate dosage and in line with your medical practitioner's advice, then, you know, that, that you should be in accordance with the law at that point. So is there going to be specific instructions to pharmacists and GPs to, to provide communication what 
what form will that take? Will it be in writing? Or will it be simply when the next time they pick up the prescription? Because we're talking about a population of people that may well have been taking medication for quite a prolonged period of time and is very normalised for them. And they may not simply think to, to ask the question. So we will be updating the advice for um, doctors and for pharmacists as well, and then they'll be advising their patients accordingly. I don't have... Do you have any more detail on how exactly that will be? I think, yeah, but I think it's a fair point for someone who's on a repeat, repeat prescription who maybe doesn't always see when they get the repeat prescription. So I think there will be a need for medical professionals to make sure that any previous guidance that they should have offered about whether to drive or not is, is, is a reminder given to patients so we can make sure that's part of the guidance to medical professionals. So can I also ask about the practicalities of the medical defence? Because it, you can conceive of a scenario where an individual has a, 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 an accident um, and, and therefore gets tested, tests positive, um, but for, for a drug that they have a prescription for, are they going to then be required to uh, 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 go along to a police station with their prescription? Do they, will they have to uh, you know, uh, give permission to their GP to uh, make available their, their medical records? What are the practical implications uh, of this for people taking prescribed drugs who may uh, get, you know, uh, found, you know, positive? I should say, answer that one. Yes, I mean, the person who is in that position, if they are claiming the medical defence as part of their defence, they would need to put forward evidence that they have, they are um, following the, guide, the guidance given as a prescription. So they would be, they would have to do that, yes. But if they do that, then, and the, the evidence shows that they were just following the instructions of the medical professional, then they will not have committed the offence. So is there a risk that we will be, um, at, at best, inconveniencing, or is there a, indeed a risk of, uh, I mean, there's a degree of stigma attached to some of the, 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 the drugs that people might take for particular um, uh, conditions, that we may be and inadvertently uh, entrenching some of those attitudes? I don't, I don't think so. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that this um, legislation, the, the drug types that, and the limits and the medical defence is already in operation in England and Wales, where it's been working effectively for the last few years. Has there been any consultation with groups that, that, that may... Uh, have uh, people who are prescribed with these There for, was extensive consultation conditions. done in 2013 um, before it was brought in and there was a Scottish sample of that and the general approach was well supported during F that. My, my final question is, is there any risk of false positives? So, if, you know, for example, people who take medication, which isn't on this list, but because of the way drugs are metabolised, uh, may appear as a, a, a false positive in either roadside or subsequent uh, drug testing. Um, the, the process that the Scottish Police Authority have put in place to test for the 17 drug types is, um, as you would expect, robust and it's going to be formally accredited um, and that should avoid any suggestion of what you're, you're indicating there and certainly the process down south, which obviously the same drug types are tested for, I'm not aware of that being an issue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> Good morning. So, uh, just very briefly at the start, Minister, you said that this would be the toughest approach in the UK. Presumably what you mean by that is when it's combined with the, the drink and the drugs, because the drug strategy on its own just mirrors the UK, doesn't it? So just looking at in terms of the timescales, it's taken, I think I'm right in saying, about four years from when England and Wales bring it in to when we'll be bringing it in. Can you tell us why has it taken so long? And presumably one would have thought that's because the success, or otherwise, of the English and Welsh scheme is being assessed, perhaps for the points that Daniel Johnson was just making. So if that's right, what was the extent of that assessment and did it really conclude that that scheme is perfect and there needs to be no change at all? Okay, so to answer the first part of your question, um, our analysis, and this is well backed up by the evidence, suggest that the biggest risk on our roads is people who are driving under the, um, you know, under the risk of alcohol. And so we prioritise, because we thought it was most important, it would save the most lives, um, uh, lowering the drink drive limit, which we obviously did in 2014. Once that was, it was important obviously to let that bed in um, before we looked at the drug driving. So that's the reason. Um, there was also 
obviously with uh, the SPA undertaking the, the testing of these drug types and so on, there was um, quite a bit of equipment that needed to be purchased and training that needed to be done and so on. So we wanted to make sure that that was all appropriate and in position before we um, moved to this point. And um, on the second part of your question, yes, obviously it gives us, um, obviously being able to look at south of the border, um, the consultation that was done in, in 2013 and the fact that the law is working effectively south of the border um, also means that for Scotland any lessons from that can be learned obviously for the implementation. I'll, I'll come back to the uh, equipment in two seconds but you say that there was the assessment in 2013 uh, and the fact that it's working south of the border can you just reassure me though what assessment has it been made has been made since 2015 that it is working, if you see what I mean. What could be learned from that? What improvements could be made, perhaps? Well, any lessons that can be learned from south of the border will be. Um, also, the SPA undertook an analysis as well of the, the drug types um, in the Scottish context um, that I set out in my opening statement um, that gives us um, confidence that the 17 drug types and the limits that we are proposing to put forward are appropriate in the Scottish context um, will be robust and, um, and will work well in Scotland. <clears throat> uh, on the, you mentioned the equipment in there, Minister, and the, in the evidence that we have, the National Police Chiefs Council say that the, uh, the equipment, the, the roadside equipment, I think, Philip Lamont, that you were referring to earlier, uh, is single use, uh, unlike presumably the drink, drink drive test. Uh, <clears throat> Has there been any assessment done of whether this might make uh, officers less likely to use it uh, in terms of every time they use this, this piece of equipment, that's it, and it can't be reused? Any assessment on that? Obviously, it will be an operational decision for Police Scotland to um, determine how to use the screening devices um, within the legal framework. Um, but in general terms, police officers obviously would retain their discretion as to how and what devices they use and in, in what circumstances. Um, and obviously this offence isn't intended to replace um, the existing offence of driving whilst impaired, so obviously we need to take that into consideration as well. But I'll ask my official to give you um, some more detail on that question. Yeah, I mean, as the Minister said, it is an operational matter for Police Scotland, but it might, might be helpful to indicate that the cost of these devices is estimated at £20, 50p for each device. So if, for example, Police Scotland, and it's a matter for them, decided to purchase, say, 3,000 of those for use across Scotland, that would total, up, I think, £61,500. So while that's clearly a sum of money that is not insubstantial, in the grand scheme of the kind of operating budget for Police Scotland, it's not massive. And clearly, through operational practice and policy, they will approach it appropriately in terms of when, which officers will have these devices and when will they be used. Thank you. Um, Minister, I wonder if you could set out, it says that maximum penalty will be the same as the Section 4 offence. Could you say what that is and what other uh, disposals might be used for someone who's found guilty of a drunk offence? So drug offense? the penalties that will apply for um, the new offence are actually set by the UK government. So um, on conviction, um, somebody can receive up to six months in prison. Um, a fine of up to £5,000 and a mandatory minimum 12-month driving ban. And a person's driving licence will also be endorsed for 11 years with details of their conviction. Yes, thank you for that. The financial impact assessment, um, there isn't any specific costings for that, but in the first year that it was in operation in England and Wales, 8,000 people were arrested. Now, clearly not all of these would be found guilty, but that's quite a resource implication for just arrests for the police. If it goes to trial, then for our courts. If there is then a challenge for expert witnesses. And um, if the ultimate maximum penalty of imprisonment is imposed, then there will be more uh, pressure in prisons. What kind of costings have been done for this? Um, I'll ask um, my official to give you um, a little more detail on the financial memorandum. Yeah, the financial impact assessment, as you say, it doesn't say exactly how many times we estimate it will be used because 
it's up to Police Scotland in the first instance to determine their operational approach. But what the financial impact assessment does is to seek to lay out three different scenarios of the total costs that may arise from different usage of the new offence based on the English experience. And so the final page of the financial impact assessment um, at paragraph 54 has a table which gives all the details that you're seeking, convener. Uh, Could you perhaps give those for the record? Yep. So in terms of um, the costs falling on the, the justice system from the prosecution of the cases, um, the mid-range estimate which would lead to 942 convictions per year for this new offence. So a little bit more than 10% of the... Um, it, the, the mid-range was taken as a rough 10% of the English and Welsh total. That would... The prosecution case costs, um, so that includes Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, the Crown Office and the Scottish Legal Aid Board. That would approximately total £1.633 million pounds a year. Um, in terms of sentencing costs, so the what happens after the court finds someone guilty, the mid-range estimate would be £548,000 a year. So the total estimated recurring costs from the mid-range estimate would be £2.182 million. Pounds. So the total cost um, of, of that list of um, things that have been looked at in the impact assessment? Well, that, that's the cost of the prosecuting the cases and the sentence disposals. costs. Yeah. Is, there any, um, is there any assessment of more prison places if it's a disposal? Is there... That's included in the sentencing, so there's, there's estimates made of, um, assumptions made about the number of people who may, from those who are convicted, may receive as a disposal a custodial sentence, and that's included at the table in page, uh, paragraph 53. Um, so the, av the average custody costs, which of course is not an actual cost, it's an opportunity cost for prison, it's, would be approximately £160,000 a year. Uh, and we know that, you know, police stations, there's a, sometimes pressure on custodial, um, uh, the ability to hold prisoners in, in, police, in police cells. Has that been taken into account too? Um, it was certainly taken into account in terms of the dialogue we've been having with Police Scotland. They haven't put in a specific estimate for that cost because it would be used in existing facilities. But um, as, a, as a point to note, certainly if more people are getting arrested, which we would expect, although we hope behaviour changes, that will put some pressure on the justice system to deal with the aftermath of that, of course, including on pre police custody. Uh, and in terms of how this was all worked out, was it worked out as a, a proportion, a percentage of um, the arrests and the things that happened in England and then a pro rata just on a population basis? Yes, it was, it was felt that... Um, it was most appropriate to look at the English and Welsh experience and then pro rata it, but then also include a uh, um, upper and lower estimate. Um, and actually, sorry, I've just looked at the, the estimates. The estimate I've been given, um, I've actually been giving you the upper estimate. There's a, there's a central estimate, which is a little bit lower, but as I say, it's in the financial impact assessment um, at paragraph 54, which gives one table which tries to outline the entire um, cost estimates. And that's helpful because I think in the break submission, they make the point that unless this is sufficiently resourced, then there's just going to be a culture of non-compliance and the, the, um, the intended benefits won't, won't be materialised. Are there any other questions? Fulton. Thanks, Convener. <coughs> two, two brief uh, questions, if that's OK. Um, convener, good morning, Minister and, um, and panel. Minister, did you say a wee minute ago there that um, a custodial sentence, and, and, I, and I appreciate that it's UK legislation driven, would be up to six months. I just wonder how that would uh, tie in with the, the policy of uh, no sentences less than a, than a year in, in terms of that overall framework. Yeah, so, but obviously that is reserved to the, U, the UK government, but certainly in um, Scotland we do um, want to move away from you know, short sentencing as a whole as part of the wider um, justice setting. Yep, excellent. The, my, my other um, a question is uh, probably something that I would assume the answer uh, is going to be uh, that, it's, that it's not a, a serious concern, but um, a lot of people earlier were talking about controlled uh, drugs that, uh, for, for medical use. I wonder if the, the law in England and Wales has had any commercial impact. A very quick five-second uh, Google search uh, led me to find an article um, done in 2000, right enough, which is now some years ago, and the abstract of that article is 
There has been a recent and significant increase in the use and availability of hemp seed oil products. These products are being marketed as a healthy source of essential omega fatty acids when taken orally. Although the health aspects of these oils is open to debate, the probability that oils derived from the hemp seed will contain, I'm not going to try and pronounce that, THC is noteworthy. Recent additions of the literature cite a number of studies illustrating the ingestion of these products, products result in urinary levels of the THC, again I won't pronounce it, eh, above the administrative cutoff. Now, I'm just wondering, in England and Wales, is this something that's came up? Eh, because I think that there would be eh, aspects of various commercial products that would have small trace amounts of things that, that are, are obviously illegal. Okay. I'll ask Philip to answer that question. The, the drug types that are on the list of 17 are split into two, of course. There's zero toler the kind of zero tolerance approach for illegal drug types and then the medicinal approach, which is at the road safety level. If within the substances you're referring to, there are elements of the drug types on the list, then if they're above the limit, there will be a, that, will, that an offence will be committed. It just depends what the substance is. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm not an, an expert in terms of the, the exact substance you're referring to there. Um, and of course, there is the more general driving while impaired offence. So someone, even if they're beneath the limit for one of the drug types here, if they're still driving in an impaired way um, due to drugs, then even drugs that may be purchased in the manner you've suggested, then they could still be committing an offence under the existing offence. OK, thanks. Although I just want to say it's a very good um, piece of legislation I'll fully support. Liam Kerr. Just briefly, Minister, if I might pick up on the point made uh, by Fulton uh, McGregor, just to clarify, one of the sanctions for drug driving, one of the sanctions for being in charge of a vehicle uh, under the influence uh, of, or with cocaine in your system, would be six months imprisonment. If you bring in a presumption, uh, which some might term a ban on sentences under 12 months, one of the sanctions for being in charge of that vehicle uh, with cocaine in your system uh, will be removed effectively. You will not go to prison for being in charge of a car under the influence of cocaine. That's correct, isn't it? The first thing to say is that obviously a presumption is not in itself a ban. And obviously um, it would be for the courts to decide on, on the appropriate disposals. And so we would obviously support that decided on the appropriate disposal because you're telling the court to take a presumption against 12 months so the six months would not be available to uh, to, to sanction the guilty party and um, the six months would be available because a presumption is not a ban and it would be up to the court to make that decision mm. thank you there's just one final question I had, Minister. It was about the RAN RANDOX testing services. There's been some concern about that north of the border. And also just to tease out where that kicks in, is that about the de devices itself? And then I think in the police submission, they said they'd be going to the SPA and using their forensic ex uh, uh, experts to, to test. Could, could you tell me where that all fits together? Yes, you're quite correct. So in England and Wales, um, there have been um, some problems with that. The forensic testing um, that's done there is actually done by different independent private providers, um, and that will not be the case in Scotland. So in Scotland, um, the forensic testing will be the responsibility of um, the SPA. Uh, they're very experienced in uh, carrying out um, forensic, forensic testing of this type in relation to drugs, and so um, we don't expect any um, similar problems to arise in Scotland as a result of that. Um, it's also probably worth making the point that there has been um, ongoing and extensive collaboration between all the relevant justice partners, um, so that would be the Crown Office, Police Scotland and the SPA um, concerning this, um, working together to put the appropriate procedures for the new offence, um, learn any appropriate lessons from implementation that's um, already um, being done south of the border um, and to take that into account in the course of the work that's ongoing in Scotland. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, anything else uh, members want to ask the Minister? Anything you want to say in closing, Minister? No, thank okay, you. in that case, agenda item three is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instru instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and had no comments on it. Uh, the motion is motion 15526 that... Sorry. <laughs> 
Yeah, sorry. The motion 15527 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Drug Driving Specified Limits Scotland Regulations 2019 draft be approved and uh, invite the Minister to move the motion. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. Members, do you have any comments or additional questions? No. In that case, the question is that motion 15527 in the name of Ash Demon be approved. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. That concludes consideration of the instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. And are the committee agreed to delegate the authority to me as convener to clear the draft, final draft report? Well, thank you for that. Can I thank the minister and her officials for attending? What's next? That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on the 26th of February when we take oral evidence on the issue of elder abuse and the question of whether this should be an aggravated offence. We now move into private session.